So let's move on then to the real reason you folks are all here. I mean, Ed is here because he actually won the, the uh, raffle. But aside from that, all the rest of us were here to hear um, Michael Dresner speak on finishing. Now, let me just read you a little paragraph here, which was the result of an exchange I had with Michael. Using only commonly available materials, you'll learn three simple finishes that anyone can do easily, quickly, and successfully with no experience and without brushes, guns, or special equipment. Okay. Great, that is a part of what we're gonna do. Now, I'm gonna read a little bit about his background and I want you to listen for the most common word that shows up here. Michael wrote for fine woodworking in the 80s and the just finishing column for American Woodworker for seven years and the finishing thoughts column for Woodworker's Journal for over 20 years. He's the author of Wood Finishing Fixes and the new wood finishing book, and painting and finishing. <laughs> He's also written for and edited a variety of online publications, and he spent 20 years on the lecture circuit. Now, guys, I accentuated the word finishing to make a point. This guy knows his stuff, okay? And I'm thinking that those of you out there who are super seasoned and have questions that you've never had anybody to ask, this is your opportunity. So as we hear the presentation from Michael, and Michael will be presenting, his son-in-law Nick will be the cameraman in the, uh, in the house. And at the end of it, we're gonna go through and we're gonna do a Q&A. So be thinking about your questions. And after he's done, we'll set up the Q&A where we're gonna be using a feature inside of Zoom, which is called um, raising your hand. And it's something that you would see um, in the chat window, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But for now, let's turn it over to Michael Dresner. And Mike, if you wouldn't mind spotlighting him, I'd appreciate it. Take it away, Michael. You're on. Hi. I'm gonna to talk to you about finishing today and we'll start with the reality that for most woodworkers, finishing is a royal pain something they don't like doing. It's right up there with sanding and sharpening your chisels. So for that reason, what I want to do is teach you ways to finish that are very fast, because you don't want to spend a lot of time doing it, that are very easy, because you don't want to spend time on a learning curve, that require no special equipment, nothing more than rags and Scotch-Brite, and that are very effective, beautiful, and even one that's incredibly durable. So we're gonna start with some of the weaker ones and move on, and I'm gonna teach you some interesting finishing techniques. The first thing to consider is if you were to take a, a spray gun, for example, and take any solid piece of wood and spray a nice even coat on the entire thing, what you would end up with is a good coat of finish on the flats, and everything on the end grain would have absorbed in. It would take you two or three coats to catch up to the point where everything's uniform. But getting a uniform film is the goal of finishing. So how do we get around that? Well, the easiest way, obviously, is for your first coat of finish, take the object and immerse it completely in a tub of whatever the finish is let the wood absorb as much as it possibly can, not only on the flats, but also on the end grain, then take it out and wipe off anything that wasn't absorbed. You will now have a uniformly sealed piece of wood, and that's your objective. For that reason, I generally start with something akin to that for the first coat on almost any finish I do. So here's the simple one of the oldest and simplest finishes is dry and non-drying oils. For finishing, we use drying oils. Most nut oils are drying oils. Vegetable oils are non-drying oils. Petroleum and petroleum products are non-drying. I think I just cut this bag. So. Oh, there you go. So this is a good example. These are little spatulas I make. 
And all I do is I put them in a bag with um, boiled linseed oil and I squeeze all the air out and let them sit for anywhere from 10 minutes to um, this set for what, two days? Two days. It doesn't make a whole lot of difference. You have to let it sit long enough so that all the end grain has absorbed everything that it can absorb. And then you simply wipe it all off. Now, when you're working with oily rags, and this is now an oily rag, what we do to make sure things stay safe is we lay them out one layer thick, go back over there and show them that, until they dry. Once they dry, they'll get crusty and hard. They are now landfill safe, meaning you can put them out with your household trash. Now, the reason we do that is that if you were to crumple up something, a rag or even paper with a drying oil on it, you have the potential for spontaneous combustion. The reason is that that oil is drying by grabbing oxygen out of the air to crosslink. That's oxidation. Rapid oxidation is the term we use for fire, but even slow oxidation is exothermic. It's giving off heat. If that heat is trapped in the pile of rags, it can get to the point of auto ignition, meaning it can catch on fire without any flame. But if you open it out one layer thick, all that heat evaporates off. So you never have a problem. So that's what we do when they're dry and crusty, which will take two to three days, depending how wet they were, um, you can throw them in your trash. So this is, this is just a piece of maple. Now here, this is a piece of maple raw. You see what it looks like? And this is what it looks like after it's been soaked in oil. So not only does the oil seal the wood, it also makes it look quite nice. Ooh. I use this for all sorts of things. Cutting boards, for example. Here's one that's about, what, 10 years old, right? Yeah. This is my pizza board, it's about 10 years old and it still looks fine. And there's nothing more on here than boiled linseed oil. When I do woods like this, this is mahogany, I generally don't like doing cutting boards out of open core woods, but when I do, I may oil it to get the appearance, but after that, I'll seal it with paraffin. So this has been sealed with paraffin, which fills up the pores, makes it easier to keep clean. You understand what I mean by paraffin? Everybody know what I mean? We're gonna assume yes and keep going. That's paraffin. Golf wax, yay! You'll find it in the grocery store in the canning aisle. All you do is melt it, brush it on, scrape off the excess. Let's get rid of this because it's leaking. Yep. And, all right, let's put all of this over here. So really the simplest finish out there is oil. And it's not an ineffective one, but to build up, I, I also do things like this. Here's another thing that's, we just dropped it in the oil. These, I turn uh, bracelets and then the little piece that's left over, we turn into napkin rings. Um, but yeah, all that is is dumped into oil for a couple of days and wiped off. The problem is that to build a finish with just oil takes a lot of coats and therefore a lot of time. And even after you're done, it's a fairly soft finish. So the next thing we did was we modified oil into something else. And the something else is varnish. Now, early on, originally, varnishes were made by taking oils and cooking them with natural resins. Then along came synthetics, alkyds and urethanes, and they're even simpler. Alkyd varnish or alkyd resin is nothing more than oil, usually linseed oil, that's been reacted with an alcohol and then with an acid, hence the name alkyd, A-L-C-I-D. Later changed to A-L-K-Y-D to make it a little bit easier to remember how to pronounce it. You can also take the oil and react it with an isocyanate and that forms polyurethane. So the truth is that what's in this can is oil, some of which has been converted into a very strong resin. So 
I'm going to use polyurethane in exactly the same way that I would use oil. So let's grab this to start with. I'm going to open up a can. And again, my objective here is to get it wet enough so that everything is uniformly sealed. When I open up the can, the first thing I'm going to do is punch holes in the bottom of the rim. Like that. And that allows me to pour it. I can get rid of these. Yep. That allows me to pour it and not get finish collecting in that rim. If finish collects in that rim, you're not going to be able to seal it again. So by putting drainage holes in, I'll be able to seal it. Now, in this particular case, this is satin. So before I pour it out, I'm going to give it a quick shake to make sure it's fairly uniform. And then I'll pour a little bit out so that I can use it. It is really not a good idea to work directly out of the container and finish, because if something goes wrong, you will have contaminated the entire container. So we're going to pour out a little bit of finish. And as you can see, the finish, this, oil, this urethane is going to drain right back through those holes. So I have a clean enough rim that I can seal this again. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do exactly what I described. I can't actually immerse the whole thing. I mean, if I'm working on a big piece, I can't really immerse it. Um, so instead, what I'm going to do is flood the wood, let it absorb what it needs to, and then wipe it off. So this is a piece of scotch pipe. It's my preferred applicator. And all I'm going to do, oops. It's flooded on, and I would do the end grain if I was going to show you the end grain. Now with this, it doesn't take as long as it does with straight oil. So you don't have to wait so long for it to soak in. However, what you want to look for here is any areas that are absorbing and drying too fast. If you see areas that are absorbing and drying, keep them wet for a few minutes. I like to keep it wet for at least five minutes. In this case, that's not happening, but with some woods, you're gonna see that happen. Then as soon as you've got it on, you can wipe off all the excess. So now you have a really good job of sealing and very little effort, no equipment and very little time. Let me show you something bigger. Let's see. So this is a more typical job that you might be doing in a polyurethane. And by the way, polyurethane is a very durable finish. It has wonderful heat resistance, chemical resistance, stain resistance, scratch resistance. So what I'm going to do here is just what you'd expect, what I did before. I'm going to flood it on, be very liberal with it. and then wipe it all off. Now, I don't have to worry about dust settling in it. I don't have to worry about brush marks. I don't have to worry about sags and runs from spraying because I'm gonna wipe it all off and it'll be nice and smooth every time. Now, this takes very little time. I'm gonna do the whole door so you get a sense of how long it would take to do a door. And I'll wipe it all off. And voila, we have our first coat of finish. Now, if you have trouble getting the finish out of these little corners, just keep a throwaway brush with you, get it out, wipe, get it, pick it up, wipe it off. And you can make sure you don't have puddles in your corners. But when I say wipe it off, I mean wipe it off aggressively. And again, the key here is uniformity. Once we have a uniformly sealed piece of wood, 
we can continue. Let's see, here's good example there. So I'm gonna pick it up with the brush. Now you're probably thinking this is a very thin coat and that's true, but the objective of finishing is to put thin coats on. You're better off with multiple thin coats than you are with one or two thick coats. Not only will the finish go on smoother, but it's going to dry a whole quicker. The total drying time of finish depends in large part on how thick each individual coat is. These are going to have to be laid out, so I'm going to put them up here for now. Yep. Now, the truth is with a urethane varnish like this, you don't have to worry so much about spontaneous combustion, but it really doesn't hurt. So get into the habit of doing it just in case. All right, you see how nice and even that is? Now, the nice part about this is for each subsequent coat, we do exactly the same thing. So let's flip this over to the side that was already done and dry. And I'm gonna show you the second coat. So what I would do in a case like this is I would put on one coat per day and that's it. It's not going to take very much time. There won't be cleanup. There won't be equipment to clean or wash down. It may take a lot of days to get the amount of bill that I want, but it's going to take little time each day. So again, quick, easy, and effective. You're not going to have coats because you're not going to have adhesion unless you let it go for more than, say, a week. Short of that, it's simply not necessary. You can just go right over it. So very little time very little effort, no sanding, a nice smooth finish, and no skill required. So what do you think? Is that simple enough? And you end up with a polyurethane finish, which is rather durable finish. Once again, if you have problems in the corners, get it out with your brush, wipe your brush off, take out this, wipe your brush, pull out the excess, wipe your brush. One puddles in there. And there you go. Nice, even, uniform finish. No sanding required, okay? Now, that's simple enough? Yes, but can I ask a quick question of Nick? Nick, when we did all our practice runs, the yeah. video looked great. Uh, right now, we're having a little bit of a problem. I'm just wondering, are you on your Wi-Fi network or are you over the cellular network? Yes. You are on the Wi-Fi? No, Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi, that's discussed. Okay, all right. Uh, it's just not as good as all the times that we've talked before. I was just curious if perhaps it had switched, but go right ahead, please. All right, here's a good example. Something that would be a nightmare to brush because you'd get all sorts of problems. Even spraying it would not be easy, but putting it on this way is gonna be pug easy. Look at this. And once again, that's where I'm gonna use my brush to get all of this in here. And then I'm going to wipe it all off. Now, I usually leave the Scotch Brite out to dry as well, although it's not necessary because nylon is, uh, uh, non woven nylon Scotch Brite won't create any problems. Nevertheless, it's a good habit to get into. So there you go. Look how nice and even that is.
No, Travis, I see some questions popping up in the chat. Do we want to handle those now or just wait till the end? Actually, um, we can handle them as we go. And since you know the flow of Michael, if you're seeing those questions, why don't you just go ahead and interject them as you feel appropriate? I'll do what I can. Um, I saw some rapid fire ones. Uh, like what the question is, what are we using to apply? Uh, we use a uh, scotch bright. Either gray or white. Gray or white. So, and there was a couple other questions. I'm sorry I missed them in the chat. One uh, is, we'll, uh, we'll is come back to the questions. Oil soaking in well. or the resins as well? That's an interesting question. And it has, the answer has to do with the wood as well as the material. So here's the rule of thumb on that. If the molecule is too large, it won't get into the wood. If it's very small, it will soak in. So what are we talking about? Well, we look at the size of molecule and express it as a molecular weight. With linseed oil, for example, the molecular weight is about 750, which is way small enough to get down into any wood, even dense woods. Um, soy oil comes in at around 350, shellac comes in at about 1,000. The upper limits at where things start to sit on top of the wood instead of soaking in are somewhere around 2,000, which is about what lacquer is. After that, you don't get good wetting. If you've ever played around with waterborne or water-based finishes, you will notice they just sit on top and you don't get that nice color wetting that you get with smaller molecules. And that's because water-based molecules, the molecules they make for water-based finishing, often go a quarter of a million to a million and larger. That's too big to really get in. The second consideration is the wood itself. As you know, there are some woods that are denser than others. So the denser woods are going to need a smaller molecule if you want it to impregnate than the looser woods. It's something like poplar will absorb almost anything because it's very spongy. Does all that make sense? Now, the real question that you haven't asked is does that really matter? It matters insofar as changing the color and appearance of the wood, but ultimately, whether you have finish way down into the wood or just on top is kind of irrelevant, isn't it? Being it's only the surface you're really worried about. Yeah. And once you get it sealed, you're gonna be building on top of the surface. That's the finish that you're gonna be looking at and feeling. Does that make sense? Yes. Another question okay. was, does the, does the wipe on system work if stain is added to the finish? Added to the finish? You mean like mixed in with the finish or as a separate step? I'm reading you literally what was then. So just answer what you choose. Yeah. Okay, if it's added into the finish, yes, it works. If it's a separate step, it works if you stain properly. And most people don't, unfortunately. So what does that mean to stain properly? The correct way, the best way to put stain on is the same way you just saw me put finish on. Flood it on liberally, then wipe it all off. You only want in the wood what it was able to absorb. If you brush stain on as if it's a paint, you're gonna have problems down the road because that stain doesn't have the integrity of paint. If you do that, yes, there's a possibility that you can remove it or move it around when you apply the finish with Scotch-Brite. But again, you notice that I'm using white, which has no, no abrasive in it. So it's not likely you do much damage with that. But as long as you stain correctly, you should not have any problem. Again, after the stain is dry, you should not have any problem with this method. Now. With dyes, there's a different rule. The rule with dyes is you don't want your first coat to be the same solvent as the dye. Does that make sense? Wow, if you yeah. put water on top of a water soluble dye, it's going to bleed. So we don't do that. <laughs> we, we use dyes that have a different solvent base than our first sealer coat. After that, you can put anything you want on it. Once the wood's sealed, it's sealed, okay? Yes, 
pigment yeah. stains have a binder, a dealer, as part of the stain. So they're not a big issue. Okay. Hey, Michael, right. let me ask you a question because we're getting really interesting questions which yeah. could be held to afterwards if you feel this is disrupting your flow. I know you were trying to cover the I three really simple care. methods. Pardon? Don't care. He doesn't don't care. care. I don't care. No. Okay, so how do you handle the grain being raised without sanding? Oil does not raise the grain of wood. The only thing that raises the grain of wood are polar solvents. There are really only two things that we use that are polar solvents. The most polar one is water and the other one is alcohol. When we get to shellac, I'm going to deal with that. And we're, okay. we're just about up to that now. Um, in most, so now for oil, oils, you, you don't need to worry about raising the grain because it's not going to happen. For other woods, it's usually not really an issue because if the first coat of finish raises the grain, then you're going to lightly sand it to get it smooth and it won't raise again. It only happens once. The problem people go through is they intentionally raise the grain with water, which you can do, there's legitimacy in that. And then they end and of their work. If you look at the surface under a microscope, what you've done is shred those wood fibers. When a polar solvent like water hits them, the fibers stand up and then they dry. And when you feel it the next day, that's that fur that you're feeling. It's little fibers standing up. Well, if you were to re-sand with sandpaper strong enough to shred the wood again, you're gonna be chasing your tail. Every time you put water on, it raises the grain again. So if you raise the grain, you go to your final sanding, then you flood it with water, you wipe the water off, you let it dry overnight, and then you go back and defer it. And what I defer it with is usually something like 400 grit or finer. And what I do, and I don't have any sandpaper, but I'm gonna show you, I literally wipe it like that. And that's all it takes to smooth it. And that's all you want to do. Deferring it is a lot like shaving. You want to cut the little hairs off, but you want to stop after that. You don't want to go any deeper. I know this because I shaved once. So you need to raise the grain and why. There's almost no situation in which you need to. The only one is that if you're using, and even this is, is rare, if you're using an alcohol or water soluble dye and you raise the grain and then seal the wood and then sand it back, there is the off chance that you can get tiny white dots where you sanded through the fiber and the stain or dye didn't go deep enough into it. Most of the dyes we use nowadays, that's not a problem because they're, they're much better than the anilines that we had when I started in this field. We're on the third and fourth generation of dyes already. And these, we don't have those problems with. So for the most part, I would be a little surprised if you had any real reason to raise the grain. But if you do, and if you wanna do that, just remember, don't sand after that. You don't raise the grain until you've gone to your, your final or your finest sanding paper that you're planning to use before finishing and then go way finer to remove the fur. Does that uh, help? Yes, thank you. Oh, okay. So Michael, have you done your first of the three and was that basically flooding, wipe off, and then time in between over the course of several iterations? Yes. Okay. But it's what, what happens is, you'll spend five minutes a day. That's all it's gonna take you to do a coat and there's no cleanup and there's no, you know, there's no technique involved. It's so fast and easy that you'll find that it may take a lot of days to get enough buildup that you want, but it's not gonna take a lot of time. It's very, very little time and very little effort. I'm a very lazy person. So I've always looked for the simplest, most efficient, way of doing everything.
So and we that's can trust what we're your advice. Do huh? we it. <laughs> okay. Yes, and Michael, the question uh, that came up was uh, for oil. You waited five minutes between flooding coat and wiping. How long would it take to wait before you wiped off polyurethane? Well, that's what I was using was polyurethane. Ah. Okay. This is here. Did you show them the can? Yep. That, that's what I was using. Yeah. Got it. So that second one that we did with the door, that was with the polyurethane. And then the uh, the cutting board that we did with the three tones, that was with a straight. So uh, let me answer your question. How long would you have to wait? Remember I said, look at the wood when you're putting your first coat on. If it's absorbing all the finish in and giving you dry spots, keep it wet until it stops doing that. You want to sate the wood. You want to completely saturate it. Once it stops doing that, you can wipe off. When you get to the second coat, remember when I flipped the door over, over, there's no waiting at all because that wood's already sealed. So you just scrub it on and wipe it off as soon as you want. Perfect, thank you. All right. So we're gonna now do the exact same technique with a different finish, right? And that's gonna be shellac. And this is the shellac I use. Let's get rid of this. Once Mike. again, I'm going to try and find a piece of wood that has a lot of end grain, right? So you can see what we're doing. Now with shellac, you're going to find it's going to work just like the oil, but way faster. It's going to absorb faster and it's going to dry faster. By the way, none of these things that I'm showing you are particularly harmful. The reason I'm wearing gloves is to keep my hands clean so that I can move from one thing to another without contaminating it. And also, I'm too lazy to wash my hands afterwards. COVID's been a problem. No, I'm just... <laughs> so that's why the gloves never hurts. But is it necessary? No, this is not a safety precaution. It's a cleanliness precaution. All right, so this is what shellac looks like. Now, this seal coat is a very interesting material. And it is something that for the longest time was not available. When, again, when I started in this field, you could buy shellac. You could buy shellac flakes, but most people bought already mixed shellac. And when you opened the can, it was very, very thick. The reason for that has to do with the way shellac degrades. As soon as shellac comes in contact with alcohol, it doesn't need oxygen, the can doesn't need to be opened. Once shellac and alcohol come into contact, it starts degrading the shellac resins and converts them into shellac esters, which are softer and don't dry as fast. Eventually you'll get enough converted that when you go to put the shellac on, it stays sticky forever and ends up with a soft film. The thicker the material is, the slower that process is. So they used to sell five pound cut shellac, which was very thick. You weren't supposed to put it on that way. They did it that way so it had a long enough shelf life to be practical. So you had to thin it. We would always feel that it would be awfully nice if we could sell shellac at the correct consistency, but that wasn't possible until around 2002. And in 2002, a new patent was issued for a process that prevented shellac from going through that esterification that it goes through. In other words, they made a long shelf life shellac and now they could cut it to where it was really usable. What is usable? This material is cut to about 25% solids. That's perfect for flooding it on wiping it, for spraying, for brushing, and for French polishing. It's the ideal mixture, and that's why they sell it that way. So this particular me material, seal coat, is de 
and it's made of what they call 5C resin, which is the resin covered by that patent. So this was a sea change for all of us. I mentioned de-waxed, and I want to show you why I use de-waxed shellac. This is de-waxed on this side and shellac with wax, and I'm going to shake it. You see the difference? You understand why I use de-wax shellac whenever I can? Clear. Okay. It's clear. All right, so I'm going to do exactly the same thing here that I did with the oil. In fact, I'll tell you, sometimes I cheat and just dip the part in there. But I won't do that today because that's, well, that's cheating. So once again, I'm going to take this. I'm going to flood it, flood it, flood it on the end grain. And you're going to see, you see this? This is flat grain. Look at the end grain. It's already absorbed in. So I'm going to keep it wet, keep wetting it. I'm going to keep going back to all the end grain areas as I do this. And when I've got enough so that it's not soaking in so much anymore, I'll wipe it off. But once again, same technique, but this is with shellac. Now, shellac is a wonderful material, very interesting material. Um, it's a natural material, of course. It's made by little bugs called Lassipalaca that look like um, an apple seed. They're about the same size, color, and shape as an apple seed. Once again, once I, I'm happy with it, I'm just going to wipe it all off. And now I have a nice, smooth, evenly coated piece of wood. Hey, Michael, since you are wiping off the first coat, there was a question that came up, which is, what about bleeding out after wiping the first coat? Shellac doesn't bleed out. What about the oils? There are certain woods that oils will bleed out of. But if you noticed, with the oil, I used straight oil. I didn't put any solvent in it. You will have almost no bleed out problems if you use straight oil or if you use straight varnish, which you saw I used right out of the can. The problems you have is when you try and thin it. That's when most of the bleeding occurs. So don't thin it. Don't <coughs> thin the oil if you're using oil and don't thin the urethane if you're using urethane and you won't have bleeding out problems. You're talking about bleeding out of the pores and things like um, oak and ash, right? right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, so now this is interesting. Yeah, go ahead, Travis. I was just going to, I don't want to break your stride here. There was just another question when you get to it. Do you use water based finishes? But answer when you get a chance. That's all. Yeah, bring that up later. Wait, okay, wait we'll to do. the end of that. And we'll talk okay. about water based finishes. Um, Sounds good. Yeah. I, I will say this I'm going to show you the same technique for all the different finishes we're using today. And we're using one that's very amazing, very, very durable, very fast. Um, not, this technique does not work with water-based finishes. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, it only works with solvent-based finishes. Got it. Okay. Um, what's going to happen here? Remember I said that alcohol is a polar solvent? What's going to happen here is that when this dries, it's going to fur up. So before I continue... I might defer this. And again, you can do it with ultra fine paper. Sometimes I'll use five or 600, uh, or you can do it with scotch Bright. Just take a piece of gray scotch Bright and take the fur off, okay? Um, after this, shellac is different than the others in that you can let a coat of oil dry and then go back over it the next day with another coat and it will not re-dissolve the dried oil. That's not true of shellac. So shellac, you can only flood on once. If you try and do it again, you're gonna re-dissolve what you put on and you will be just treading water. So if you wanna build a shellac finish, you then have to switch to another method. Now that can be um, spraying. You can just buy a can of shellac. And by the way, when you buy shellac and it says shellac, in a can like this, it's going to have the wax in it. 
But if you buy a can of shellac that says shellac and it's an aerosol can, it'll be de-waxed. They won't tell you that, but you can trust me, it is. Why? Because they found that the wax clogs the little aerosol tip. Right. So they've always only used de-waxed and aerosol cans. There you go. There you go. Or you can resort to something else. You can resort to French polishing. Did you want to see French polishing or is that? I'm, gonna look at yeah. Ed. I'm looking at Ed Gladney here. Ed, you want to hear French polishing? Jeff says yes. Okay. All right, Jeff is a piece of French polishing. A lot of yeses for French polishing. Now, once again, if I French polish, what I will do is seal the wood just like I showed you, let it dry. It'll take about 10 minutes or so, defer it, and then I'm going to make up a French polish pad and I'm going to polish with it. Has anybody done French polishing? We can look in the chat room here for reaction. Anybody done French polishing? Somebody tried to. Okay. What problems did you have? Jeff, you want to un I'm un asking because I'm going to teach you how to get rid of them. Now, what I've done is I've taken the interior. I, I will share. I had. Go ahead. Go ahead Jeff. Sorry there. I, I had a lot of streaking and unevenness. That right. was my okay. major problem. And, and it didn't seem to matter how thin or what, whether I used uh, linen or cotton. OK. So what I do is I take cotton and I usually wrap it in linen and I'll make a nice pad. And then I charge the pad with my French polish. What is my French polish? Well, traditionally it's just shellac. But the problem with that is, is if you French polish with shellac, you're gonna run into three problems. If you don't move smoothly enough, it'll stick and leave rag marks. If you move, put too much on, you get what's called curdling, where it makes little ridges. And the reality is that the French polish pad will put on material or take off material. So you can get streaks because you're pulling it right back off. Okay, now you can learn how to have a really deft hand at French polishing. And the first thing you need to learn is how wet to get your pad and how to deliver it. And the way you deliver it is you squeeze the pad. Now, this isn't wet enough yet. I'm going to show you when it is. Before we shake, let me. Don't let me shake this nope. yet. Okay. You can modify your French polish so that it's almost foolproof. And it's really simple. How do you do it? You take your shellac, and this is seal coat in here. Can you see the layer here? Can you see the clear yes. layer? This is the shellac. Yeah. Okay, what I've done is add about 20% mineral spirits. Okay, that is going to act as a lubricant. So instead of sticking and pulling, it's going to polish like a dream. Wow. Now, what happens, this is like oil and vinegar salad dressing, it's going to separate. So each time you go to charge your pad, it will shake. Now, I just want to, sorry, this is Nick, the son of your turner. Um, when I'm finishing pens or wands, really anything I'm doing on my lathe, and I've never had any problems with this particular from I, I only started woodworking seriously about a year ago at the start of COVID. And this this kind of polish was what I used exclusively until I started getting into some CA work, which we'll cover here in a little bit. But um, very, very fantastic it's formula. It's yeah. really cool. Okay. Sorry, so excuse me, the, the video was the pad. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say the video, at least where I was viewing, was completely uh, pretty much stopped uh, after you, I think, did you say you shake it? Yes, you have to shake it. Okay. Because it'll separate out. See, now it's all not separated. Got it. But it'll separate out. So every time you give it a quick shake, you charge the pad. And what your objective is, is
ease the you see what happens this the liquid to the absorb but when i squeeze it you see it yeah can can you guys see this yes now we can yeah yeah okay, okay. so the key here is as you're applying it you squeeze so that you feed the finish to the surface of the pad just enough and it's nice and thin so i'm going to increase my hand pressure as i go and when i need to recharge it i'll stop and recharge it So the squeezing, if you know how to do it right, has creates a constant additional flow. Exactly. Got it. Now, what I just did, all that back and forth stuff, you couldn't do that with straight shellac. It would have, it would have given you bands. But with this stuff, you can. Trying to get the best shot I can, but I know video quality has been going down for some some folks here. So okay, so nice even coats here. All right, you understand? Yes, we do. Thank so you. you can continue by spraying, or you can continue by French polishing, or you can change your finish. Shellac is a really wonderful base for almost any other finish. So let's say, for argument's sake, you wanted to put lacquer on. I would do my first base in shellac flood it on, wipe it off, and switch to the lacquer. Or switch to polyurethane, the same way we put it on the raw wood and the finished wood. You with me? Yes. Shellac is a really nice universal finish that goes well on almost anything else. Okay? <clears throat> Very handy stuff. I was going to do this in shellac as well, but I don't think we need to. No, I think we're good. Yeah. Are we all good on shellac and French polish, everyone? Uh, we're getting a question. So By no the way, there's a video out there that I did. It's about five minutes long showing how to French polish, beginning to end. If you find it, um, watch it. It covers all your questions. Yeah. Travis, I, I saw a couple questions pop up, but I didn't read them in time. So one of them says, uh, so there's no pumice. Uh, whoop, it's just scrolled off. Hold on. <laughs> Listen. So there's no pumice on the French polish pad? No. What is the point of that? Do you know what the point of it is? No, I don't. I'm a literal okay. reader. This is an old, old technique where you're working with open pore woods. So instead of taking the time to fill the pores or seal the pores, people would just French polish and add pumice so that it would seal the, fill up the pores. It's just putting, making mud out of your shellac. Got it. I don't recommend Sorry, doing guys, that. There we go. We're if back. you want to fill the pores, there are a number of really good ways to do it. In other words, if you want to do a closed pore finish on an open pore wood, use pore filler. Right, what type of pore filler should you use? I'm going to show you one a little bit later. If you want the pore filler to be clear. However, in most cases, what we use is an opaque pore filler. The best ones, absolute best ones out there are Timbermate and Goodfilla. Okay. okay. Um, you'll find them in most of the woodworking stores. Those are gypsum based and there's no binder in them. Now, why is that important? Because if you put a binder in your filler, you have to worry about whether that filler is compatible with the next coat of finish. If right. there's no binder, you don't have to worry about it. Secondly, it means you can mix any type of colorant into it and it'll accept it. So those things are wonderful. They're also rejuvenatable, meaning if they dry out, just add water to them, close it up and come back the next day and you'll have nice manageable material. They are sold the thickness of putty. 
When you want to use it as poor filler, thin it out to whatever you like. I like the consistency of cream, but it's up to you. You just add water till it's manageable. How do you put it on? Same basic way. I'll take the pour filler and scrub it in with a scotch Brite pad. And then I will take, where's our credit card? Uh, right there. Then I'll take a credit card, right? Just squeegee it off, just like that. Let it dry overnight, give it a quick sand and you'll have a beautiful pour fill. Now, real, real fast, I just wanna throw in there, um, I thought 98% battery was going to be enough and we're down to just about 20. So let's move on to the next technique before we feel any more questions. In? Do you want to get a thing and plug in? Yeah. Do you want to hold that for a second? Yeah. Okay. All right. Just here. Let me get rid of my guy. Well, Stand by. We're going to switch. We're going to switch. Hey, it's the other beer. By the way, everybody, that was Nick. Hi, everyone. And Nick, Nick at the All start. Right, we're running this. out of juice. So we're going to go get a cord and plug in here. And just so you guys so know, at the start of this, he had 93% battery. It was part of the startup check. But yeah, uh, well, I use a lot of battery up because I'm rather large. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they had to use the widescreen format. And you know, that just eats up ha, battery. Ha. What tell right, us about so the let, front of your bib? Let's talk about the next thing I'm going to show you. And I promised that I would show you a way to do pore filler if you want clear pore filler which okay. didn't exist for most of the time that I worked as a finisher, but it does now. So I'm gonna show it to you. All right, hey. what we're gonna talk about next is a very interesting material. Most of you are probably familiar with cyanoacrylate. Are you, are you powered up? Is it working? We see you. Well, yeah, here, hold on. Sorry, guys. Here I am thinking I was good at this. Okay. All right. Talk to them for a second. Okay. Most of you are familiar with cyanoacrylate, correct? Um, right. Super glue, ultra fast glue. I'm going to show you how to use a very unique cyanoacrylate formulation as a finish, as a pore filler, as a gap filler as um, an film, okay? Most, can we keep going? Keep, keep, going, keep going. Most cyanoac are alike than different. But about, I don't know, a year ago, two years ago, somebody came out with one that is truly unique. So let's talk a little bit about finishes and glues and what the differences are. In reality, finishes and adhesives are usually mostly the same thing. So think about what you want from an adhesive. What you want is something that goes on easily, thin, that sticks to wood, and that dries really nice and solid. You also want the adhesive You can also switch to my phone if you know how to do that. Now tell me what you want from a finish. You want something that's thin, goes on easily, is clear, and sticks to wood. So there's a lot of similarities between adhesives and finishes. And now we're gonna cross the line and use an adhesive as a finish. Okay, that should work. Yay. Yay. Okay. <laughs> now, the difference between using cyanoacrylate as a finish. There we go. That's definitely power now. Sorry, guys. Okay. All right. So, one of the realities of finishes is that they have to be somewhat flexible. For example, um, the most common lacquer that we know of is called nitrocellulose lacquer. It's made from cellulose nitrate. 
Straight cellulose nitrate is extremely brittle and very hard. In fact, it's completely useless as a wood finish. Why? Because it is so brittle that when the wood moves, and all wood moves as moisture changes for its entire life, it would crack the finish immediately. So to make nitrocellulose lacquer, we add a plasticizer. That makes it just flexible enough so that it can move with the wood. How flexible does the finish have to be? Well, that depends on how much the wood is going to be moving. We know that wood that's outdoors moves more because the humidity variances are larger. Therefore, exterior finishes are usually much more flexible than interior ones. With interior finishes, we usually keep the humidity within a limited range so the parts don't move too much, but they still move and finishes still have to be flexible. Cyanoacrylates, most of them, are not formulated to be flexible. However, along came one guy and he offered a flexible cyanoacrylate that he calls fill and finish. You can show them the whole batches of it there. And the company is Glue Boost and it's the only one out there. Now there's more to this. The next problem with cyanoacrylate is that it dries so fast that if you tried to apply it as a finish, it would just glue the applicator to the wood. Well, these come up with a material that doesn't dry, that gives you an almost unlimited open time. So that means you can put it on, manipulate it, get it nice and smooth. And then when you're ready, all you do is spray it with the reactant. And this material will cure it immediately without air bubbles, without turning white, without crinkling. Now I want to throw out there real fast. Sorry, it's just speaking to Glue Boost um, and its efficiency and what we're talking about here. Uh, I've recently gotten into making rings. I'll show you one of my wood ones because you guys are a woodworking group. Um, and my inlays are all Glue Boost um, right there. So that's a nice little pigment. We'll do a pigment here in a minute as well with the Glue Boost. And then that's one of my metal band ones with an opal inlay, opal and glow in the dark, which is where the, the white that you're seeing there. But it's um. It's a phenomenally strong material. Um, now understand, he's using crushed stone as inlay mm -hmm. and filling all the areas around it with this cyanoacrylate. So, and then buffing it to a gloss. So not only is it a finish, it's a filler as well. And we're gonna do that. We're gonna take a little piece and and, um, and fill it and show you that. Yeah, the one with the little, uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Now there's another issue with this stuff. If you wanted to color cyanoacrylate, the second you mixed it with any colored powder, it would kick over and turn into a solid. This stuff does not. So you can mix it with colored powder and make a solid color. Hey, All Michael, right? So like you just said that we've been able to, with this product, get the benefits of CA glue as a thin layer, but because of the plasticizing or the flexibility that's built into the glue boost product, it will move with the wood and that makes it viable for finishing. Am I getting that right? That is correct. Okay. And did you also say that it's possible with this to uh, perhaps tint it? Okay. Can you, can you tint this as well? Yes, yes absolutely. Yes, we're going to do that. We're going to do all okay, these things great. for you. First, we're going to start out clear. And here's the thing. Once you get a finish made out of cyanoacrylate, it is incredibly durable. That's why Nick uses it for rings. Think of what rings go through. The constant wetting, the constant abrasion. Well, the thing that I use the most every day is my favorite knife, which is I don't know, about 50 years old now. Um, where's the, 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 the thick? thick? That's the thick right there. That's the thick. Is this one open? Uh, yes. Yes, it's open. Okay, so I'm going to take my scotch pad here. 
I'm just going to uh, flood this stuff on and just wipe it on. And as I said, it's not going to kick over until I tell it to. Now, I will say, having worked with this stuff extensively, I've probably gone through about 12 of these bottles um, in the last year, uh, particularly of the, the thick formula that we're using right now. Um, you do have several minutes before it starts to get that tacky gumminess that usually hits with, with CA. And usually you're done with whatever you're doing by that point. So if so you hit I, it hit it with the, app, with the uh, activator, when you're done, it sets almost immediately um, within about a second. All right, you just saw all that? There we go. And in about two minutes, that's going to be dry. To, is it dry to the touch yet? Dry to the touch. Dry to the touch already. Is that fast enough and easy enough for you? <laughs> yes. And that is a durable finish. Now, what I would really do on this one is um, I would now sand it lightly, just smooth it up a bit, and then put three, but probably just two on this one. Okay. I mean, if you want, I'll do that. But obviously, once you cure it, you can put another coat and another coat and another coat. But it is a good idea to rough up the surface a bit. And in most cases, I would just use some scotch Bright and rough it up with that. Smooth it and rough it. And as you can see, I'm working on it right away. So there you go. It's an incredibly durable, incredibly fast, easy finish. But there's more that we can do with this. this we're doing uh, let's do this first okay so remember i promised you you could fill the grain of open grain woods this is apitong if you're familiar with it and i and for whatever reason guitar makers are hell bent on having clear pore filler i don't personally understand it but so i've just put some down and i've taken a squeegee um <laughs> My old debit card. Yep. If it wasn't your old debit card, it is now. And I'm just going to. Yes, exactly. And, you know, I'm going to throw out there, guys, just as a. So I, I work for the Kroger Corporation and um, the gift cards that are there at the. Uh, if you guys want cheap squeegees, the gift cards that Kroger's get are non inventoried items. I mean, you can just take them off the shelf. I mean, don't take the thousands of. Uh, so like, but, but if you just need one or two, have old gear. I'm gonna spray it, I'm and sorry. in about a minute or so, I'll be able to sand it Michael? and have clear, filled pores. Michael, that's Therefore, that's this remarkable. because it's inert. Hold on, this because it's inert is compatible under any other finish. So you can get clear pore filler and then go to whatever finish you want. High tech, low tech, you name it. The guitar makers use this often. Some of them are using it to fill the pores and then going into things like polyester, urethanes, uh, acrylics, lacquers. All right, what else can you do with it? Uh, ever do any inlay with commercial inlay strips like this? Sometimes they have little gaps. Let's do a thin one for this. This comes in thin and thick. So for this, I'm going to use a thin one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pot this just the way I did before. Pot it and then wipe off the excess and kick it over. And now when I go to do whatever finish I go over, this with, it's not going to pucker in in the little spaces between the inlay. Now, I mentioned commercial made inlays because I know that when you do inlay yourself, there are no gaps in what you do. I'm aware of that. <laughs> hey, Michael, when it looked as though until you applied the activator, it was a low, vis low viscosity, easily spreadable, not hardening. Uh, uh, material. Liquid. Is that correct? Liquid, yes. Yeah, correct. Okay. And then there was a question that uh, someone had, which was uh, 
What about fumes? You know, when we look at CA glue, we always see fumes coming off of it. Is there any fuming coming off of this? I can smell it. Yeah, it's it's definitely noticeable if you put your face right over it. Otherwise, it's it's a pretty inert. Like, it's just there's nothing really to it. Um, I it's not bad. No, but I don't know of any finish that doesn't smell. Okay. Do you? Uh, no. <laughs> My so nose I mean, really, you have to choose. Does right. this smell bother you? If the smell bothers you, then don't use it. Uh, but then again, I know of people who every finish the smell bothers them. And yeah. for those people, leave your wood raw. You know, you can do that too. There's no rule that says you have to finish things. <laughs> those people would I'm, not I'm be I'm serious. Well, I mean, I have wooden Michael. spoons and there's no finish on them. And I have wooden spoons that are 30 years old and just fine. Right. So well, you Michael, don't have to finish things. Michael, think about it. Who is going to attend your talk on finishing if their belief is they don't need a finish? One or That's two. Yeah, we get some converts going. Yeah, no, no, it's not <laughs> converts. It's the Schadenfreude crap. Oh, okay. That's oh, what okay. it is. There you go. <laughs> Revel in others' misery. All right. Very so, remember, I said now, if you've ever done this, if you've ever tried re regular cyanoacrylate and mixed powder into it, it kicks over instantly. So, I'm going to put some down here, and I'm going to take some colored powder. And what I am mixing on is UHMW, ultra high molecular weight plastic and as you can see do i have enough in there is oh yeah that's a little lenny you see this oh, it's yeah. still liquid and i'm going to take this and i'm going to put it into groove that i cut in this and fill it up because this is like there's a void and you want to fill it with something fancy Okay, and as you can see, this is still liquid. I'm going to squeegee it off. Now, can you see this? Yes. That's the little groove I carved yes. in there to show you that we can pour fill with this, uh, to fill gaps with this stuff. Um, and then, obviously, I would sand off the rest, but I'm going to kick this over. Now, because this is so thick, I'm going to leave it more than a couple seconds. Yeah. But the point is, you can fill voids and normally of course you would fill it with if you're trying to hide it with the same color as the wood but you can also do it in contrast to make fake inlays for example I'm going to show you one more thing what was the other thing i was going to show them um we did pore filler we did yep. the gouge we did um i don't rightly okay. remember i don't really remember either we did the okay. inlay cool it might I mean, be a question. This is even good for stuff like, in terms of durability, if you have something like a little goblet that you actually want to use and drink out of, and you don't want it destroyed, the finish destroyed, this will do it. It's extraordinarily durable once it's cured. And it's the right flexibility for wood, but it's very, very hard and very tough material. Is it, is okay? it a unique product in the marketplace, Michael? Are there other- It is at this point. At this point, there is only one person selling it, <clears throat> the guy who makes it, that's Rick, and his company is Glue Boost, and it is a unique product. And I can tell you that it's very rare that I run across unique products. Now, for uh, decades now, every single company that sells finishes or adhesives, because I'm also known as an adhesives expert, has been sending me samples of their newest, best, <clears throat> most different material. I get to see them all and I get to play with them all. This one is unique. I've never seen anything quite like this to the point that after I pulled and played with it a bit and learned about it, I called the formulator, the owner, and I spoke to him at great length about it. Um, Michael, one it was of the a questions... wonderful conversation. We have since become good friends. Cool, cool. But yes, this is unique. That... And by the way, look at this. Remember this, the stuff I mixed to put in there? Yep. It's still, still liquid. Yep. Michael, one yep. of the questions that uh, somebody had, and I had as well, because I purchased some Glue Boost recently, it all came in small quantities. Do you know if it's always sold in those small bottles and the tall spray, or do they have larger containers? 
we're going to let Nick answer this. You know, it's a funny story. It's funny you should ask that, Travis, because literally the other day when you and I talked, I was emailing Rick myself asking if he, because I, use, like I said, I use so much of this in my shop all the time that I was asking if he sold in larger quantities and uh, he does not at this time. That's Got what it. he said. Not yet. Not yet. Not at this time. Not yet. Got it. Got so it. hopefully here in the future, because I was, I wanted to buy by like the gallon because that's <laughs> what I, I go by. Right. Um, but he was like, no, that's not happening right this second. So okay. we'll see. Good. But uh, yeah. One of the and problems so in buying things like, one of the problems of buying things like this in bulk is, um, sticker shop yeah it it's was expensive. kind of expensive yep yep however you saw how far i mean did you i mean i literally put a few drops on here and spread it out over this whole piece of wood as a so how, do you take, how do you take it to a polish after you've applied it and you've activated it to get it to the polish when you showed us that little goblet that looked mm -hmm. like you'd taken it to a polish. Do you do something? What yeah, do you except do? that that's not cyanoacrylate. It was just oh, an okay. example. Got but it. these um, rings are. Let, show them your rings. Yeah. You see these rings? Sorry. The way you do it is exactly the same way you do any finish. Once the finish is cured, you buff it. You sand it really, really smooth, and then buff it with buffing compounds. Got it. Or buffing compounds. Exactly the same as you would any other finish. All finishes buff up the same way. The only issue is how long do you have to let it wait before you can buff the gloss? On something like, um, well, a, a polyurethane, an oil-based polyurethane, it's going to be at least six weeks and often a lot longer, depending on the formulation. Ditto with lacquer. Lacquer is going to be at least three weeks before you can buff to a high gloss. If you do it before that, then as it sinks, it loses some of its gloss. You don't get to yeah. keep that brightness. Okay. With this stuff, it's minutes. Yeah. Minutes after you kick this, you can buff it. So what Nick does is he'll fill these rings right on the lathe on a mandrel. Yep. He'll fill them and then finish them all and then smooth them and then buff them all without taking it off the lathe, all in one cool. long shot. So it's quick so to be it is fast. Yes. How about shelf life, though? Do you know yet? So shelf how life. Stuff sits? I I have only had one small issue, and that is that after um, between a year and a year and a half, uh, it doesn't react as quickly to the accelerator. Other than that, I have either gone through the bottles so quickly that it has not been an issue, or um, what does Rick say? What does he call the shelf life? Does he call one year? I honestly, I didn't even ask him. And again, this is another issue with, with buying volume, which yeah. is why he's loath to do it. Our shelf material has a fairly short shelf life. A year to me is short in the realm of finishes. Yeah. Okay. Um, you asked about water-based finishes. Thank you, Darren. Are we ready to move on to that? Yes, we are. Do you have ready. any more questions about any of the stuff I showed you? What do you say? Yes, go ahead. Okay. The first thing we have to understand with water-based finishes is what they are and what are they? Um, they're not water soluble. You understand that, right? Because if we used a water soluble finish, anytime you put water on it, it would dissolve. So really what they are is the same finishes that we're used to but instead of being mixed with an organic solvent like mineral spirits or lacquer thinner, they are suspended in water. What they do is create little balls of resin and they use a surfactant. And the surfactant is a molecule that's lipophilic at one end and hydrophilic at the other. In simple English, that means one arm grabs onto the resin and the other arm grabs onto the water. And that lets them suspend these little droplets of finish in water. So all the water is doing is it's a vehicle. Unfortunately, most water-based and waterborne finishes have very high molecular weights. So they do not wet wood effectively. 
they sit on top. If you've ever seen a water-based finish on something like walnut or rosewood, and then you contrast that with um, an oil-based finish or a solvent-based finish, they look very different and they tend to look chalky or pasty or wan. And that's because they're not wetting well. The molecules are just too large. Now, over the years, they've gotten better. They're getting smaller and smaller molecules, but there's a trade-off. And the trade-off is this. The size of the molecule is directly related to its durability. So the larger the molecule, the tougher it is, the stronger it is, the more durable it is. So there's this awkward line drawing. And with water-based finishes, most of them are too big to really look great on most woods, at least in my opinion. Now, I have to preface this by telling you that for many years, I worked as a water-based formulator. So I've had extensive experience with it, but you ask, do I use them? <laughs> and the answer is no, I don't, because I know all of their advantages and their disadvantages. I also said that you cannot do the wipe one method with water-based finishes. Why? Because water-based finishes cure in a way that's very different than other types. In solvent-based finishes, there are two different curing methods. One is called solvent evaporation, in which the molecules stay Come back to us, Michael. Evaporate pot is the spaghetti pot model. What? What's we going on? About 10, 15 seconds there. Could you first repeat that part again? Going back to the spaghetti pot? Is that where we start? Yeah. Back to the spaghetti pot? Back okay. to spaghetti pot. So in, in an evaporative finish like shellac or lacquer, you have these long gangly molecules like spaghetti. Now imagine in that pot, you could easily put tongs in and pull out one strand of pasta, right? However, if you let all of that water evaporate away and that pasta coagulates at the bottom, you'll no longer be able to pull out one strand. That is exactly how evaporative finishes cure. And I mean exactly, we'll go further. If you were then to take some warm water, pour it back into the pot and let it sit a bit, it would once again separate and you could pull out one strand, proving that those spaghetti strands never turned into anything different than what they started out as. And evaporative finishes always redissolve with their own original solvent. So if you take 50 year old shellac and put alcohol on it, it will liquefy. If you take lacquer and you put lacquer thinner on it, it will liquefy. Does that make sense? It totally does. Second type. Second type is reactive finishes. All oils are reactive. What they do is they pull oxygen out of the air and they use that oxygen as a link to hold hands. When they cure, they are no longer the same molecule that was in that can to start with. They are now a new, bigger, much more complex molecule. As a result, you can thin oil-based finishes with mineral spirits, but if you put it on a dried oil finish or a bar excuse me, a dried oil varnish finish, it won't do a damn thing to it. Absolutely nothing. It's now impervious to that. Does that make sense? It totally does, yes, thank you. Water-based dries in a completely different and third way. Here's what happens. Remember I said there's little balls of finish floating in the water? When we put on a coat of it, we have a layer of water with lots of little balls of finish. Soon the water starts to evaporate off. What's left is the finish and what's called a co-solvent or secondary solvent. And water-based finishes have another solvent that evaporates, they hope, more slowly than water so that once the water goes off, everything compresses down. And this other solvent makes those little balls sticky enough 
Ah. So they stick together. They form a little brick wall, as it were. You with me? Yep. Then that solvent goes off. And now you have a dried film that's kind of like a brickwork wall of and little balls of finish stuck together. Here's the problem. How fast does water evaporate? Because remember I said, for this to work, the water has to evaporate off first and leave the solvent behind to stick those balls of finish together. So how fast does water evaporate? Well, that depends on the humidity, the relative humidity, doesn't it? So it is entirely possible to have a situation where the humidity is so high that the solvent, which is not dependent on humidity for evaporation rate, goes off before the water does. Uh. Then eventually things dry up and the water goes off and you have what looks like a film with integrity. At that point, you'll be able to take your thumbnail and scritch off the finish just like that. Because if it doesn't go off in the order it's supposed to, you do not get integrity. Of Is this the it. fundamental reason why you don't use water-based anymore? No, no, there's a lot of reasons. There's oh, really yeah. a lot of reasons. <laughs> I mean, obviously, this is only a problem if you're not controlling the relative humidity right. in your work area. And I've never had that problem. Got it. I and do control the relative humidity. So at what point does that start to happen? Somewhere around 85% relative humidity or higher. Okay. And that happens in certain parts of the country. It doesn't happen here where I live, but it does happen in certain parts of the country. Secondly, water is very temperature sensitive and with water-based finishes if it's too cold they don't behave well they don't lay out well so it's a much more finicky finish than solvent based finishes got it okay yep now okay. beyond that you can make water-based finishes out of any type of finish you want so you can make ultra durable ones or you can make weak ones doesn't matter you can do it all because any just about any finish can be born that is suspended in water with the right surfactants there is another issue with water based and that is in order to get those little balls of finish to stay suspended it's a very complicated formula if you look at shellac, there's really only two ingredients in it, alcohol and shellac resin. Lacquer, you're going to get from four to seven ingredients. With water-based formulation, you often have upwards of 20 different ingredients, all of which have to be perfectly balanced with one another, which is why they tell you you cannot thin water-based finishes with water. You put in more than 10% and you're going to disbalance all those other chemicals that are all relying on a careful balance with one another. Right, right. So it is a sensitive, finicky finish. And if you don't have to use it, I wouldn't. And if you're not spraying, you probably don't have to use it. Got it. And I've just taught you how to finish without spraying. Right, right, right. So Michael, um, there are people who, you've held on to over, almost 100 people, over 100 most of the time for an entire 90 minutes, which means people are really into what you're talking about. On our website, we list all of your books, but which would you say- Wait a minute, if, you list all four of them? Yes. You know, one of them is out of print. Well, then they have to chase it down, but- <laughs> and, and one of them is not worth buying. <laughs> okay, so which one, if it's on this particular topic of the chemistry and approaches to finishes that are best for woodworkers, which of your books would you recommend? Well, it's not quite like that. Here, these are, this is interesting. My very first book came out with this bound into it. And it was like, to answer the question, how do I choose a finish? How do I know which finish I should use? And this was a wall chart that you could hang up that's guided to choosing a wood finish. And it's got all these considerations and this came free with the first that I, that I did. And then when they went to like the set, get rid of the wall chart. So instead, when I did a remake of that book, 
I simply, oop, this is the wrong one. I simply shrunk the chart down and printed it in the book. So this book, the New Wood Finishing Book, is a textbook, meaning each chapter is a step. So the first chapter is choosing a finish. Then there are chapters on application, on um, uh, spraying, on brushing, on touch up, on stripping, on steps rubbing in the out. Process. I'm sorry. One more time. Steps, steps as in steps in the process. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. It's chapter by chapter, step by step. This is a textbook. That's all it is. The problem with a textbook is that if you forget something, it's difficult to look it up in a textbook if you don't remember where it was. So later I came out with this book, Wood Finishing Fixes, Quick Answers to Over 175 Most Frequently Asked Questions. It's very easy format to work with. Each page starts with a question and the area, and then it goes on to a single line answer. That's for I know what this is, but I just can't remember if it's this one you do it this way or don't do it this way. Then each page starts a new question. Short questions are two to a page, but at every page, you're always at a new question. And it's laid out in a way that's very easy to research. This was before the internet. <laughs> <laughs> the time I said to them, you know, this should be media, this, you know, because it's, it's way easier to look up stuff on media, but they weren't ready to do that. Right. Hey, Michael, now, uh, by the way, both of these books are available as ebooks. Okay, great, great. And folks, they are on our homepage, on the right column, there's a link to this presentation, at the bottom of which are links to each of his books. So they're not the ebook version, but they are books and they're links to those books available in Amazon. So Michael, uh, just in the interest of your time and ours, uh, do you suppose we could take like three questions before we wrap it up? Yeah, as much as you want. Yeah, I, I'm already home. <laughs> <laughs> well, most of, our, most of us are too, actually. <laughs> I think I'm the only one who's not at this point, so. This is, look at this, this is still well, liquid. Just a fun fact here, yeah. This is still liquid. Yes. So guys, in case you were wondering of, how much time you have. Yeah, as a, as a way of getting the question, to, of identifying the person to ask the question, in the bottom of your screen, there's a reactions button. And uh, we're gonna use the applause uh, icon in the reactions. If you would say by choosing the applause icon, if you would like to ask Michael a question, I'll call out your name and then you could unmic. And I see that Kevin Deal is already unmiked and ready to go, am I right? <laughs> Sure. By hello, the way, hello, Michael. Kevin Deal here. Yeah, hold on uh, one second. Travis, hold yes. on. Travis, um, you have my email address. You're welcome to share that with people yeah, who don't get a chance. Okay. And they can email me and I'll go ahead. What's your question? Uh, well, I wanted to thank I, I I enjoyed everything you presented and uh I, I do I've been doing wood finishing for a few years and and I agree with everything you you've shown. Uh I really like the, the information on that uh, uh, glue boost. I'm going to have to give that a try for, for smaller projects. You're, you're known often for teaching people how to sand properly, though, and you didn't That's get into that true. at all today. Uh, if, if someone was doing, say, a, you know, working with shellac in a, in a period furniture type piece, uh, do you agree or disagree that you'll get more color from the wood with a, a scraped fit, fit finish versus a sanded finish. From the wood? No. No. I mean, when you, when you look at something like this, okay, this is raw, this is oil. That color. Okay. From the oil, right? And that's the color came from the oil. This is not this has nothing to do with sanding, scraping, whatever. There's an inherent problem with scraping, you know, which is if you have a box like this, you could scrape it, 
right? Yep. How are you going to scrape this? <laughs> and the rule with scraping and sanding is you can do one or the other, but not both, because the surface of a scraped wood area is different than that of a sanded one. So if there's any part of it you're going to have to sand, you got to sand the whole thing, or it's not going to behave the same. Scraped, finished, scraped um, wood surfaces will take stain differently and take finish differently because in the process of scraping, what you're doing is compressing and closing up the pores. Does yep. that make sense? In yep. the process of sanding, you're doing just the opposite. Just the opposite. And frankly, I want the finish to go somewhat into the wood. I want it to have a good hold and grab on so that it's not likely to chip off later. So I'm not a big fan of scraping. Okay. And again, there's the second parent problem that almost nothing I make is square. I mean, I, I was a guitar maker for 40 some years. They're not square. Got it. Yep. Okay. A, a second question is what do you, kind of uh, stain do you like to mix with your timber made with fit filler? You can mix anything with it. You can mix dyes, you can mix pigments, whatever you want. Okay, all right. So Michael, we have a person that wants to ask you a do question. I admit, what do I do? Almost nothing because it comes in like 14 different colors. In fact, good filler now comes in powdered form. There's no, you add the water yourself. It's just a powder in a bag, even easier. Hold that for a second. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, okay. anything else? And this okay. one comes from the person who actually put us in touch with you and is responsible for getting you onto our agenda. Dell would like to ask you a question. Go ahead, Dell. Dell, you can call me anytime. What the hell are you doing at here? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Just real fast, here's the, some older of the good fella. That's good fella. Yeah. Got it. And is okay. there a bag of it in there? there is. So good fill and timber made are the same thing. They're both excellent, excellent, excellent. Yeah. What do you want, Dell? Dell, you're muted. Del, are you there? Stand by. I'm yeah. Muted? No, he's oh, muted. I just wanted to share a story here. I, I got a chance to work with Mike some years ago on a very expensive boat. And Michael was doing touch-up repairs with a one-hair paintbrush. So <laughs> that's the type of work he can do. Was that the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia? Um, yeah. oh, okay. I can't say. <laughs> hey, Del, thank Where's you for that? making this happen. Getting yeah. us in touch with him, recommending Michael. We're obviously very impressed and lucky to have him. Thank you. So one more one of the things I do on, One of the things I do on my demos is I teach touch up. So I have this board and I gouged out a section of it and filled it with a solid color putty and then touched it up. That's it. Where his fingers pointing is where it's touched up. I really hope we got a high enough bandwidth so you guys can see that because it's pretty well, incredible. Yeah, it looks great. Yep. Or can't see it. So there you go. I started doing touch up in 1972, apprentice to someone, and I've been doing it ever since. So after a while, you you get good, or not, or you go out of business, I guess. <laughs> okay, so why don't we have one more question? If somebody wants to uh, put a hand up using the reactions, I spin from page to page here, looking for somebody with a hand up or an applause. <laughs> well, it looks like we're winding down then. Okay. So look, guys, obviously this was fantastic. Um, Michael, we probably could have taken hours of insight from you. We got a really good dose. We've got your books. And uh, if you don't mind, we're going to keep you on our short list for looking at uh, a future conversation in the future. Thank you so much for doing My this. My pleasure. And everybody, thank you very much for um, being here tonight and uh, hope to see you again in not too long from now. Have a good evening, everybody. Have a good night, thank guys. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael.